you would, open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, continuing to teach through the life and times of Jesus Christ, and we're all the way up to the story about Jesus and the woman at the well. One of our favorite stories in all the Bible. It's this great text. And when you found John chapter 4, I want to invite you to stand for a reading of God's Word. Thank you, if you're able. Father, we uh, call upon you to speak to us now through your Word. We pray that we might hear your voice and you might help us to understand it and then apply these truths in our life. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. It says uh, in verse 4, John 4, verse 4, but Jesus needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come home, come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you shall neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I speak who speak to you, am he. You may be seated. I want to talk to you about this passage. It's a very important passage. And at this place, this well, near the city of, it says Sychar, the Hebrew name for the city, the ancient name is Shechem, and the uh, Arabs call it Nablus, the Palestinians, the Muslims call it Nablus, same city. And uh, he confronts her here at this place. And
And she asked this wonderful question. She said, the Jews don't have anything to do with the Samaritans. There's many times that some people in our society are seen as unacceptable, not as good as, uh, not the right ones to be talking to, not the right ones to be reaching out to because they're different or they're not as good as or because they have a pretty bad background or they made mistakes in their life and because they made these mistakes they are now disqualified from being acceptable. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> Nonsense. You look at what Jesus does. Jesus talks to anyone who's willing to listen to him. My wife can tell you, I'm willing to talk to anybody that'll talk to me. <laughs> we can be anywhere and I will strike up a conversation with somebody. I couldn't believe it. Yesterday we were in the restaurant and it was too crowded. We were going to leave, but I saw this guy with a hat sitting there and the hat said, sometimes you need, to, need a good knock with a hammer. <laughs> And I was wondering why he was wearing that hat, and I, they were all leaving, and I was starting a conversation, I wanted to know why, and it was quite a story. Ask me some other time, I'll tell you about it some other time, why he needed to knock in the head. But I was thinking about, I would tell you a story, and it's a, it's a story about a man, made, man made, named Ted Stallard. And he was a young man who was turned off by school, and he's one of those people that wasn't doing that well, and you'll, you'll see as I tell you the story, and we'll see what happens in his life. He was very sloppy in his appearance. He would sit in class, and he would stare off into space. This irritated his teacher, Miss Thompson. She used a red pen to put big red X's on all the wrong answers on his tests. And his school records revealed that in the first grade, Ted shows promise with his work and attitude, and he has a poor home situation. Second grade, Ted could do better. His mother was seriously ill and he receives little help from home. Third grade, Ted is a good boy but he's too serious. His mother died this year. Fourth grade, Ted is slow but he's well behaved. His father shows no interest. Well Christmas arrived and all the children brought gifts to the teacher and put them on the teacher's desk. And Ted's gift was wrapped in brown paper. And Miss Thompson opened each one of the gifts as the children crowded around. And Ted's gift was a rhinestone bracelet with half of the stones missing and a bottle of cheap perfume. And the children began to snicker. She silenced them by taking some of the perfume, putting it on her wrist, and then letting them all smell the perfume. And then she put the bracelet on. And after school, Ted came up to the teacher's desk and she, he said, Miss Thompson, you smell just like my mother. The bracelet looks pretty on you. And I'm glad you like my present. Then he left. Well, Miss Thompson asked God to forgive her because her attitude toward him had not been very positive. And the next day, the teacher were greeted, the, the students were greeted by a teacher who had decided to treat each of the children with love, no matter who they were. And so Ted began to show a lot of improvement. He caught up with the other students, graduation came and went and he moved on. Miss Thompson didn't hear anything else from Ted for a long time. And then she received this note. Dear Miss Thompson, I wanted you to be the first to know I will be graduating second in my class. Love, Ted. Four years later, another note arrived. Dear Miss Thompson, they told me I'll be graduating first in my class. I wanted you to know, love, Ted. Another four years later, and dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stallard, MD. I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm getting married on the 27th of next month, and I want you to come and sit where my mother would sit if she were alive. You're the only family I have now. Dad died last year. 
Well, Mrs. Thompson went, Miss Thompson went and sat in the place where the mother would sit at the wedding. And uh, the compassion that she had shown to him had earned her the right to sit in that place. And I want to submit to you that how you and I treat people can have a life impact on people. It can change their whole life, the way we relate to other people. You know, you and I are always going to meet people who are kind of down and out or discouraged or just easily distracted. And quite frankly, they become somewhat annoying and it takes extra grace to relate to them. But you and I don't know by looking at the external appearance why. What's going on? What brought them to this place in their life that they're struggling? Why is it that they're going through this in their life? And I'm going to submit to you that the woman at the well is one illustration of a person who was undoubtedly in that kind of condition. She had a rough life and she needed somebody to listen. And it was no accident that Jesus showed up to ask her for water. Did you know? Anyone can come to Jesus. I don't know who you are. You may be saying, well, Pastor, you just don't know my background. You don't know the things that have been done to me, or the things I have done, or the things that people say about me. You, you don't, we don't know. And if you're here today and you're saying, I just don't think I'm good enough. Nobody cares about me. I want to tell you today, you came to the right place. Because we have good news for you. Because God cares about you. And we care about you. And this is an absolutely wonderful church family here. And it's a safe place. I know you cannot just go anywhere and any group of people, and be safe. But I will tell you, this is a safe place. And I'm very thankful that it is. Jesus had to go through Samaria. I'm going to show you a map in a moment. And he came to this town in Samaria called Sychar, or Shechem, or Nablus, same place, near this plot of ground where Jacob had given his son Joseph the well. And uh, this well was there, and Jesus tired, was tired from the journey. And I want to show you some pictures. That's a picture of the well. It's kind of in a cave. Now, there's two wells. There's one that's in the Byzantine church, and it's got marble, and it's really fancy. But I'm going to tell you, I think this is the well. It's just in a cave. It's a well. And... That's what it looks like on the outside. That picture was taken in 1894, before we had all the tourists flying over there and all this. But this is the, there's like a cave, and inside the cave is that well. And I'll show you why. It says he had to go through Samaria. The reason is he was up in Galilee. He had to get down to Jerusalem. In order to get from Galilee to Jerusalem, on one of the routes is Shechem. Or Sychar, same city. And right there, by the way, another two places, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. If you want to have some fun, look those up in your Bible and see who spoke from the top of those mountains in, in that place. It's a very significant place. But it happens to be right about half of the way between Galilee region and the Sea of Galilee and uh, Jerusalem. And that's why he had to go through here. But with God, there is never any accident. Is there? No. Everything just happens to work out that he's at the right place at the right time to meet the right person. So I've got a word to you today. If you're here today, you're not here by accident. You're here to hear this message because it's for me and it's for you. It's not my message. It's God's message. And it's a message of hope and encouragement and good news for anyone who would come to him. Because anyone who would come to him, Jesus has a word for you. Okay? So, it's a message for all of us. It goes here and it says in verse 7, 
when a Samaritan woman, it doesn't say if, when a Samaritan woman came, Jesus said to her, you see, he was there waiting for her. Will you give me a drink? And his disciples had gone to the town to buy food, and the Samaritan woman says to him, now she had come out from the town, little, it's a village really, and come out from this village to draw water. And she had to draw water, and she's drawing water in an interesting time of the day, midday. We're going to talk about that. You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. The Jews really looked down on the Samaritans because they were a mixed people and they had mixed in some pagan beliefs with some beliefs about the one true God of Judaism and so they had kind of mixed this up. They had intermarried and they were looked down upon by the Jews. And uh, so for him to talk to her, for him to talk to any woman, would be unusual, but for him to talk to a woman of Samaritan descent would not be normal. <laughs> but he says, she says, how can you ask me for a drink? <laughs> and then he answered, if you knew the gift of God, okay, we got to back up a minute. Remember last week we were talking about for God so loved the world that he gave he gave his only begotten son. So when Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God, he's talking about himself. Jesus is God's gift to us. And who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, Jesus, and he would have given you living water. That's not the regular kind of water we get. Emmy, Emmy's brother, Art, comes over and he's, he's always bringing some kind of special water. We, we used to be uh, fuzzy, fuzzy water, carbonated water. Now he's got ionized water, and this is supposed to be more living water. Well, i got to tell you, it may be bubbly, and it may be very good for you, but the real living water is from Jesus, okay? And every day we're going to come into contact with people like Ted, aren't we? Right? There's all kinds of people in trouble around us. People who are discouraged and they have made mistakes and sometimes they've made their own bed and they lie in it, right? They get into trouble. And some people are very good at hiding the pain. How are you? Fine. No, I mean, how are you really? Fine. Would you please move on to somebody else? No, I mean, really, how are you? Who's been talking about me? <laughs> Because don't we all have something to hide? It's a habit, or it's something that happened to us years ago, we've never let it go, and we're having a struggle with our own image, how we feel about ourselves. Well, we need to get rid of the stinking thinking and start putting on the thinking like God has for us. Jesus loves you, and you are so precious and valuable to Him that He gave His life for you. If you were what the other kids said, or if you were what other people say about you, Guess what? He wouldn't have given his life for you. It's all nonsense. The truth is you're worth more than the life of the Son of God. That's your value. Set price. And so you and I are going to run into people all the time in life or encounter people in life who really need a word of encouragement. And there's a lot of pain in people's life. Sometimes it's physical pain. Sometimes it's personal pain. And I'm not so sure which one's really worse. I think sometimes... Personal pain is worse than the physical pain. Rejection, addictions, abuse, betrayal. I think some people wonder if they stop smiling, would people figure out that they're really hurting inside? And in this meeting of Jesus and this woman by this well, we learn about Jesus' personality. You want to know about Jesus? See how he reacts to this woman who's kind of a down and out, a woman who's been rejected. Jesus <laughs> got thirsty. He's, he really experienced all the physical things like we do, hunger and cold and heat, and he was thirsty. And it was around the middle of the day, they were on this long journey up through the, this mountainous terrain, climbing on up toward Jerusalem, and Jesus goes to the well, and it was usually the custom of women to go, and they either drew water early in the morning when it's cool, or in the evening, early evening when it was cooler, because the middle of the day is hot. 
Do you notice it doesn't say that she was among a group of women? Why? Why was she the only woman? You gotta meditate and think about these texts. She was hiding from everybody else. She didn't go when all the other women went. In Jesus' time, women could not divorce a man. Only a man had the right to divorce a woman. Jesus knew all about her. Jesus said she had had five husbands, and she was now living with a man. And that implies that she had been rejected by five husbands, divorced five times, because she couldn't have done that. Can you imagine the self-worth this woman had and how she viewed herself? She felt rejected. She felt alone. She felt ashamed. She was going from man to man, and she was trying to find someone who would love her and care for her, and she was now living with a man because he had not married her. There are some here who understand what I'm talking about. And like this Samaritan woman, you're wondering, does anyone care for you? It could be a man or a woman. Does anybody care for you? Some of you are so feeling rejected. Some of you experienced that. Some of you lost a job, and you feel rejected because you lost the job. Some of you have lost someone through death. Some of you feel alone, and you feel isolated from others. And some of you are still dealing with some kind of habit in your life and struggling with it and you try to hide it because you should be so ashamed if anybody knew about your habit. And so deep in your soul you're feeling guilty and ashamed and you don't want to tell anybody about it because heaven's sakes, if I told anybody then they'd know about what's going on in my life and if they knew what's going on in my life they're going to reject me. And so people are afraid. <sighs> okay, in this church I think we're finally getting to the place I've been here a long time now. <laughs> and I think we're getting to the place that's actually safe for people to say, I'm having a problem. I need help. And there are other people in this church who will not start gossiping about you. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. It's a place where you can actually say, I'm having a struggle and I need help. People will come and come around you and pray with you for it. They're going to ask, what can I do to help you? And you can talk to them about what's going on in your life, and it is actually awesome to have a church where you can talk about real problems, and people care about you, and they won't reject you. Do you realize what an awesome, wonderful church this is? It is that way. So if you're here checking it out, God brought you here to a good place and I'm so glad to be the pastor of this church family. I got good news for you. Jesus confronted the woman with her sin. But Jesus still loved her and he offered living water to her even though she was a sinner. Whenever you meet God face to face, you will always be confronted with your sin. But that's a good thing. Because when, you conf when he confronts you with your sin, the wonderful and the awesome thing about that, you know what it is? You can ask him to forgive you and he will forgive you of your sin and cleanse you of all unrighteousness and you can have a complete new start in your life. You don't have to live in bondage anymore to your past. You can be set free by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. You can have an entirely new life. Give your life to Him. Trust Him. Watch and see what this woman does. That is an amazing story that it happens here in this passage. I believe that Jesus Christ will minister to any person who will listen to Him. If you're willing to just listen. So this woman tells Jesus that He could not be talking to the, that She says, you shouldn't be talking to me. And, and, and Jesus puts this woman and her needs above all the customs and all the traditions and all the political correctness of his day. He cares more about her, regardless of who she is and what is her background,
than what anybody else would have to say. You know, people might even have said about you, you're a hopeless case, and you're never going to change. Well, I want to say you can't change yourself, but I know one person who can change your life forever, and his name is Jesus Christ. He sees your potential, and your life matters to him. And he's here right now in this place. We're not alone. He's willing to talk with you. And he's willing to give you living water. And he's willing to give you eternal life. And he can fill your greatest need. Which your greatest need is to be forgiven of sin and receive eternal life. That's the greatest need we have. She said, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where can you get living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Yeah who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock. And look at Jesus' answer. He said, everyone who drinks this water that will be thirsty again. He's talking about the water in the well. If you drink out of the well, you'll have to come back and get more tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, and two days after that, and three days after that. There's no end of having to come back and put the bucket down the well and hoist up the water and carry it on your shoulder or on your head, however they did it, back to your place. She thought her life didn't matter, but it matters to God. And Jesus was still really telling her, your life can be much more than and better than you think. Do you like your life right now? I'm talking to you. Do you like your life right now? This world will never satisfy you. You can try to find satisfaction in all the stuff of this world. What a great time to talk about it. We're looking at Christmas. Christmas has, for most people in the world, become something so completely different than celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's all about, what am I going to get for Christmas? And I'm going to tell you right now, if I have Jesus and I didn't have anything else, I am rich. <laughs> I'm satisfied in that. And aren't we blessed above and beyond anything we ever ask or think? Yes, we are. <laughs> and then he confronts her with sin. And by the way, every time you go to God, you, you need to come to him and say, Yep, I sinned. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to be able to talk to you. But Lord, I admit my sin. Please forgive me. He will forgive you and cleanse you. <laughs> Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. That's how he confronted her. She said, I don't have any husband. Jesus said, you're right when you say you have no husband. And then it, he says, you've had five. And you're even living with a man that is not, you're not married to. You see, what Jesus did is he showed love and compassion for her. He didn't show love for sin. He showed love for her. There's a difference. He confronted her with her sin, but he loved her. And he knew her life, and he knew her sins, and he knew her motives, and he knew her thoughts. And he, he knew all this because he knows that sin must be dealt with. He knows all about it. He had to die on the cross for our sin, didn't he? He knows all about it. So before Jesus would work in her life, she had to admit that she was a sinner. First thing, you're a sinner. Yes, I am. Well, I can offer you living water, but you're going to have to repent from your sin. That's all part of this story, really. And he knows why you're here today. You. And the best part is, Jesus still loves us, in spite of everything in our past. So what's our response? It's what Steve does every week when he leads us in worship. We worship God. We need to come prepared to worship. Do you come prepared to worship? When you come in this place, you should be prayed up and thinking about, I'm coming to worship God. I'm coming to worship the one who gave his son to die for me so I could have eternal life. I've come to worship him and to praise him and to let him know I am thankful for my salvation. She said, I can see you're a prophet. She didn't quite get it yet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mount, but you Jews claim the place where we meet and we must worship is in Jerusalem. And he said, believe me, a time's coming when you won't worship either in Jerusalem or here. You'll have to worship in spirit and truth. And he's, of course, telling the truth there. 
Then, verse 23, a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. They're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and truth. You see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, you need to get real with God. you got to be sincere with God. You need to admit your sin and come before Him and worship Him as He is holy, holy, holy God who loves us in spite of our sin. What a great Savior we have who would suffer and die for us. What a great Savior who loves us in spite of ourselves and He was willing to to hear our cries and to answer our cries when we get real with Him. Wow. All the religions of the world, there isn't any in which God, a false God in other religions, offers His own life to die for people. It's always the people sacrificed for God. With ours, God came and gave His life for you and me. He is God. And then it says, Jesus reveals truth to anyone who seeks him. The truth is, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything. And Jesus said, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Wow. How'd you like to be at a well, or maybe I guess today it'd be the 7-Eleven, and you're going down and got to get some drinks and... Somebody in there says, I can give you a drink that you'll never have to replenish. It will satisfy your thirst for the rest of your life. Who are you? Well, it doesn't matter who I am. I'm not going to give it to you to repent of your sin. Why did you just steal that out there? Ooh, I guess I better take it back. It says, just then the disciples returned and they were surprised that he was talking to a woman. You see, I said they didn't talk to women. The men didn't. Only their own wife or mother. But one, no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? And then, what I want us to think about doing. We have been given today a card. Why don't you take that card out? Think about it in a minute. Everybody got one? Is there anybody who didn't get one today? Didn't get a bulletin? Didn't get a card? If you didn't, raise your hand. I know somebody will get one for you. All right. We have more of these. We're going to have them on every week between now and Christmas or the Sunday before Christmas. Why is that important? Okay. I want you to just hold on to it. We're going to look at this story and I want you to figure out why am I bringing this up? It says, leaving the water jar, leaving her old water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and they made their way to him. It's the same thing Andrew did with Peter when he said, I've met a man, come and see, and brought Peter to meet Jesus. That's what this woman is doing. She's saying, I met a man who knows everything about me. Come and see. And I've given you cards. They're in the bulletin today. And we're going to have them in the bulletin every week between now and through December 15th. And the purpose of these cards is for you to say, I met a Savior. Come and meet Him. Come and see. Come and check it out. Okay? That's what this is about. It's an invitation. Tom called it a flyer. Tom, I'm going to call these invitations. Okay? Invitations to invite people to come. Let's see who takes us up on that. If you need more of them, if you want to get real energetic and hand out more, we can get more. we got a whole box of them. This woman became a soul winner. And she was telling her story to all the people back in the town where she lived. Which means when it says, says in this, Come see a man who told me everything I did. These people in this little village knew who she was. They knew she was living with a man. 
They knew that she had met a man who told her about her five husbands and about the man she's living with. And she's coming and telling them, I believe I've met the Messiah. And they come out of town. Now, they would normally not listen to this woman. She was an outcast. But because of the way she was coming and so excited and confessing all of her past and coming and telling them, I've met the Messiah, they followed her and went back to meet Jesus. See, it doesn't matter who you are. My question to you is, are you willing to tell anyone about your Savior? If you are, God bless you. You're a wise person to tell people like she did. I love the fact that she, it tells us she left that old jar, see? She, leaving her water jar. Every little word in the Bible is so important. She left the old jar behind, the one that she'd been carrying around because it was now living water which was in her. I ain't dragging that old clay pot around anymore. I got living water. You need to come meet him. He's the Messiah. They had to follow because they went, this woman has so changed. What happened to her? Who is this man? And they had to come. Is your life so on fire for Jesus Christ that people say, when you invite me, I'm coming. <laughs> it says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, and we sang about light this morning, I believe so. It says, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us from all sin. So don't keep the light. Don't keep the good news to yourself. John said in 1 John 1, 3, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. So, 1 John 1, 3 says, That which you have seen and heard we declare to you. Why? That you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So why don't people tell? Some of you think, I don't know enough. I don't know how to answer all their questions. I'm going to tell you right now, if you've been in church for how many years, you know so many more answers than people who aren't believers. And also, if you're a believer, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. And what you and I don't know, He does. Because He knows all things. And don't ever think, I don't, I don't know enough. You just go and tell them you met a man. Do you, this woman, do you think she knew everything about Jesus? Did she know all the Old Testament scriptures? Could she have explained everything to them? No, she just said, I met a man. He knows all about me. Come and see. And they came. Don't ever say that. I don't know enough. I'm not an evangelist. Well, I'm not an evangelist either. I'm not. But I can be a pastor teacher and I can tell you what we need to do and we need to do that. I'm not an evangelist. I don't want to be pushy. When I hear the shofar blow, that great horn that the angel blows to call us to go to heaven, I don't want to say, oh, give me a minute. There's somebody I want to tell. Send me back. Just give me five minutes. I got somebody I want to tell about Jesus. But I thought you felt that would be too pushy if you told them before. I might as well just take you to heaven now. You want to live longer? Start telling people about Jesus.